This is our audio lecture for Chapter 14, Media Ethics. I'd like to talk about the uh, case study at the beginning of Chapter 14 because uh, I'm not sure students really realize uh, what it takes to be a photojournalist. A reporter at the scene of a disaster or any other dangerous situation can sit back, well not sit back, but can can be safely out of the action. A photojournalist has to be right there. Ryan Kelly was uh, assigned to cover the uh, uh, Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, the, the, the one that drew neo-Nazis and similar-minded people. Uh, the event turned violent, as you know. And photographers are taught, you know, news doesn't recreate itself. So shoot everything while you can shoot it. And then back in the newsroom, try to figure out whether it should go in the paper or not. One of the photos that he took uh, showed the car that was deliberately uh, uh, driven into the crowd of anti-fas, anti-fascist uh, uh, protesters. And it shows the moment of impact where the car uh, throws people up into the air. Uh, that photo will be reproduced uh, on the next slide. So if, if you are upset by graphic images, uh, look away. You can imagine uh, the photographer and the editors uh, back in the newsroom debating you know, whether to print this photo or not print this photo. You know, certainly the, uh, the readers knew about the rally and knew how out of control it became. But what a photojournalistic image does is it adds a, a, uh, an emotional element to it. So if you're on the chat box, tell me, if it was your newspaper, uh, would you publish the photo and why? And if you wouldn't publish the photo, why? Let's talk about the difference between morals and ethics. Morals, code of behavior, based on religious or philosophical principles. Morals are usually introduced to us at an early age and morals can define right and wrong in very sweeping terms. And especially as we get older, we find that these morals don't always apply perfectly. Ethics are a product of the Enlightenment. They are a way of uh, injecting rationalism to the moral teachings. Trying to figure out not just what's good for individuals, but what's good for the society at large. Ethics come into play when uh, moral principles collide or when there isn't a, a clear right or wrong answer. On the next several slides, I will present to you ethical tools. And you should think of these ethical tools as being a little bit like tools in um, a workman's toolbox. Not every tool is perfect for every situation. Our first ethical tool is the golden mean. It is associated with Aristotle, the Greek philosopher of 2300 years ago. Aristotle is famous for saying moderation in all things. And it's in that frame of mind that his famous ethical tool, the golden mean, comes from. 
So in the book, it is described as a just right point between excess and defect. Martinson is a uh, ethicist who is uh, quoted in the ethics chapter. And what our ethicist warns is don't just use the golden mean as a way of picking a midpoint um, and then that's it. Martinson said, yes, you should find a moderate solution, but one that has virtue. Here's an example. Several years ago, uh, in class, we discovered a website called TUG, T-U-G-G dot com. And it's a website where if you have enough friends, or in this case, enough MassCom 101 students, you can reserve a screen for one night in a local theater, and you can show the movie of your choice, and it can be a movie night. Well, we decided we were going to do this for a MassCom 101 field trip. And the question became, what kind of movie are we going to show? Well, some of the young men in the back of the class thought that something very explicit, very boundary-pushing, maybe Borat, would be uh, a good idea. It would sell some tickets. Uh, there were other students who maybe were thinking about bringing their nieces, nephews, children, grandparents, and they didn't think that Borat would play very well for that. And so they recommended maybe a children's movie. And of course, other students were not terribly enthusiastic about that. So the golden mean was applied, and it was not just a midpoint in terms of is it a movie for adults or is it a movie for children, but it also sought to find virtue in the situation. And in this case, I happen to find virtue as it has to do something with MassCom 101. We can't just go out to the movies one night and you know call it a field trip. It has to say something about mass communications and these times. So we wound up booking uh, a documentary called Craigslist Joe. And it was about a gentleman who crisscrossed the country for a month with no money, no contacts, just a uh, smartphone, and he lived off of Craigslist. It was a fascinating evening. The second ethical tool we will talk about is the categorical imperative. Uh, this is not an ethical tool that is several thousand years old. This is an ethical tool that is more like hundreds of years old. Immanuel Kant is associated with the categorical imperative. And at the core of it is acting in a way that we would want everyone else to act. And so really what's central to this is not using people. Do not treat them as a means to reach your end. And so in applying the categorical imperative, you take your actions and you have them writ large. You know, what would be the consequence if everyone littered? What would be the consequence if everyone drove dangerously? The next ethical tool is utility or utilitarianism. And this is an ethical tool that comes from some folks who are a little odd to be in the ethics business, uh, a group of 19th century English economists. And being economists, they wanted to quantify everything. They asked, what would do the greatest good for the greatest number? The leading utilitarians were John Mill, Jeremy Bentham, and John Mill's son, John Stuart Mill. This is a quote from John Stuart Mill. An act's rightness is a desirable end. So you get a couple things out of that quote. One is there's a little bit of reverse engineering going on. And two, it comes perilously close to saying the end justifies the means. I've always thought utilitarianism was 
a little dangerous that uh, as the framers of the Constitution uh, uh, warned, you know, we need to worry about a tyranny of the majority. And I, I, I think a unchecked utilitarianism um, could lead to that. In a normal semester, I can have more students wanting to take my class than I have space for. And so the utilitarian problem is, when do you stop adding students? In some semesters, if you add everyone who wanted to add, you'd have a class that was so big it would be practically unteachable. On the other hand, if you don't add anybody, uh, there are folks who will not uh, uh, get the class who otherwise could have, and it slows their pathway through college. The next ethical tool is the veil of ignorance. This is kind of a specialized ethical tool. It's specialized for conflict of interest type situations. Another thing that's a little different about it is it's a 20th century ethical tool. It is uh, uh, associated with Harvard psychology professor John Rawls. This photo of Dr. Rawls, who died just a few years ago, is, I believe, from the 1970s or 1980s. Well, the veil of ignorance, the key to it is to not let the status of people involved or their relationship to you uh, taint how you treat them or how you solve the situation. Under the veil of ignorance, everyone should be treated equally. Glendale College professors are encouraged by administrators to have some sort of a point system uh, in grading. And I think the reason for that is a, a, a certain objectivity. Um, a point is a point. Uh, a correct or an incorrect uh, on a multiple choice question works the same way for everyone. That's the veil of ignorance. Um, some years ago, when Joe Biden was vice president of the United States, he got a summons for jury duty, just like if he had been Joe the barber or Joe the insurance agent. Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States, got called in for jury duty. Now, I'm pretty sure that he could have gotten out of that if he had wanted to. But in what is an application of the veil of ignorance, Joe Biden showed up for jury duty just like everyone else. He sat in the jury room just like everyone else. He got asked questions by uh, uh, attorneys just like everyone else. He did get on a jury. He was not elected jury foreman. Uh, his jury heard their case, and when it was over, he and the others were all paid $10 a day plus mileage. That's the veil of ignorance for you. Social responsibility. The media in the United States and uh, other nations, as, as you'll see in the, uh, the last chapter of the book, is along the social responsibility model. Uh, this theory comes from the 1950s. Uh, it was a committee that was uh, uh, formed by the fellow who is in this picture here, Henry Luce, the founder of the Time Life magazine empire. Under the social responsibility theory of media, the media has a responsibility to give voice to the public to be able to ask those hard questions of industrial leaders and politicians and cultural figures that the average person doesn't really get to do. So the media has a responsibility to give voice to the public and to the society at large. Even back in the 1950s, there was a concern that as the biggest media outlets were becoming part of larger and larger corporations, that it could create conflict of interest. I mean, what if uh, one 
a part of your corporation owns television stations, and another part of your corporation owns department stores. If there is a strike by employees of that department store chain, you know, can your news operations cover that fairly? Under the social responsibility model, media should accurately report on important stories. You know, I'm not sure that our media always properly alerts us to what is an important story versus a trivial story. It should accurately report important stories. Put them into context. Um, I believe that there was something like 300 murders in the city of Los Angeles last year, right around that number. Well, you need to put that into, the con into context. Was it 100 the year before, or was it 500? I mean, that matters. If it was 100 the year before, then 300 would be a horrible increase. 500 would be a terrific decrease. So, you know, put, put the news into context. Report on all parts of society. Just because there's a part of society that doesn't watch your television station or read your newspaper, it doesn't mean that they're not worthy of being covered. Please note the social responsibility model also calls for the media to provide comment and criticism. So yes, uh, the Western media, the U.S. media, part of its job is to comment on things going on in society, in government, in the corporate world. Cicela Bach is a uh, philosophy professor who has created a well-regarded model for working through ethical dilemmas. Step one, consult your conscience. What does it say is the path that you would feel good about? Two, think about all the various things that you could do to get through your ethical dilemma. And you know, one option is always do nothing. And sometimes that can be a pretty good option, but certainly not all the time. The Bach model also calls for folks to hold an imaginary dialogue with people on all sides of the ethical dilemma. What would be their objections? What would you say about those objections? What would they want? Would what they want be practical or not practical? Here's something for the chat box. And we'll think about the Bach model in terms of this. You are writing for the student newspaper, and it is customary for the student newspaper to do an article about the candidates running for student body president. And you find out, and it's good information, it's, as far as you can tell, it is accurate information, that one of the candidates for student body president has been arrested twice for shoplifting. Is it something you should report in the student paper? So, to work this out, one, consult your conscience, what feels like the right thing to you. Two, what are the various things you could do in working through this? Remember, one of them is always do nothing. Third, hold an imaginary ethical dialogue with all involved. Explain the action that you're thinking about taking to the candidate, to the candidate's opponent, to your student newspaper advisor, to the advisor to student government. Explain your decision to a professional journalist. Let's talk about how reporters are sometimes, they sometimes do not live up 
to their ethical ideals. Occasionally, a reporter is caught making up facts. There was a veteran um, police reporter in Houston who, after a long and distinguished career, was abruptly fired because it became apparent that some of the folks who he would quote in crime stories were made up. Now, what made this reporter hard to catch was that when he would talk to a police officer or he would talk to a judge or, you know, somebody known like that, it was accurate. But this reporter had a uncanny knack to quote these people off the streets, barbers, taxi cab drivers, waitresses, etc., who always seemed to have the perfect, clever thing to say. And there were names attached to some of these folks who were saying these clever things. And that was where the reporter, uh, where the reporter's undoing was. Um, when, when the reporter became suspected, uh, others began to look up those names in social media and elsewhere and track down whether these people existed, and they didn't. Also, journalists fall short sometimes of their own ethical ideals by lying about who they are. I mean, sometimes uh, people don't want to talk to a reporter but they would talk to, oh, a police officer. And so, yes, there have been reporters who have pretended to be somebody other than a reporter. Well, here's one for the chat box. What do you do as a reporter about a newsmaker, a community leader, maybe the mayor of your town, who says something that is obviously untrue, but because this is an important person, you have to put it in the paper anyway. Let's say, for example, that uh, you are talking to the mayor of Glendale, and the mayor, uh, for some reason, is a little bit defensive about homelessness in the community. And so the mayor says, there are no homeless on the streets of Glendale. Well, all right. As a reporter, do you pass that through? Just quote the mayor in the story and leave it at that? Or do you seek to balance that story or correct the record in some way? And how do you do it? without making it seem that you, the reporter, are not being neutral. Going all the way back to uh, Henry Luce and his committee in the 1950s developing the social responsibility model, uh, going all the way back to then, there's been a considerable amount of concern about ever larger corporations that have a news organization as part of the many businesses that they're in. So if the company that owns your television news operation is also a defense contractor, well, how do you how do you report that story that uh, that your parent company, the defense contractor, that their jet engines for the army didn't work right in a demonstration? This is a growing problem. More and more media outlets are owned by fewer but larger corporations. Now you say, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, a big company that has a news operation and, and other businesses 
the other businesses may not be as important as, let's say, uh, building jet engines uh, for the Air Force. Maybe the parent company owns a professional sports team. Uh, what would be the harm in uh, maybe your newspaper's coverage of that team being a little extra enthusiastic? Would that hurt anything? Uh, I want to hear that in the chat box. Sensationalism is another ethical concern in the media. I guess what I should do is I should um, define what it is. It's news coverage that panders. Uh, panders would be, oh, it's just giving in to the baser curiosities and obsessions of the audience. It's not telling people things that are important. It's pandering to audiences with lurid, highly emotional stories of crime, sex, violence, and celebrities. And I've got to say, what's unfortunate about sensationalism is it's pretty good business, uh, oftentimes, to provide sensationalistic news. Uh, it's not news that generally gives people useful information about how to live their lives, but, you know, but that's, that's where we are. Tabloid laundering. Tabloid laundering is a term that I didn't uh, hear until I, uh, I read Ralph Hansen's book. Tabloid laundering is what has happened in some of uh, what's sometimes called the straight media. Uh, in recent years. The tabloid media, oh, that's things like the National Enquirer. They may get obsessed with some, you know, celebrity story, and they're just beating it to death, and it's becoming a big thing. And so when a respectable news outlet like, oh, we'll say the LA Times, starts covering on that controversy, uh, that's tabloid laundering. They're taking that tabloid newspaper story, and by reporting on the phenomenon, they're kind of getting in on it themselves. Now, the thing about sensationalism is, okay, well, first off, let, let me give you the definition of it again. All right. News that panders to audiences, lurid, highly emotional stories, crime, sex, violence, and celebrities. Here's the question for the chat box. The question is, what's the matter with it? I mean, if there's profit in just endless stories about celebrities behaving badly, well, then why not? Why shouldn't all the news media just get in on that? You know, it's no secret that a lot of news organizations are in financial trouble. Maybe sensationalism is their salvation. The Sago mine disaster is an example of what happens when credible news organizations trying to get the story right, but under strict deadline pressure, get it wrong. Sago was a coal mine in West Virginia. There was an underground cave-in. It was a life-or-death situation. Thirteen miners were trapped deep underground. Early in the evening, as national news media were beginning to descend uh, upon this corner of West Virginia, one body was found. So it was unknown the fate of the other twelve. Coal mining is a big thing in West Virginia. And so the governor of the state flew in and was part of the vigil throughout the night. By about midnight, there were rumors that the remaining 12 miners were alive and that they would soon be reunited with their families. Among those who believed the rumor was the governor. The governor informed reporters that Miracle of miracles, 
the 12 miners are alive, they will soon be re reunited with their families. The reporters, finally having a story, wrote it up very quickly, and that was what the morning papers went with. And it was wrong. The governor believed the wrong rumor. In reality, only one miner was alive. All the others were dead. And so news organizations, of course, got out their corrections as soon as they could, but they were blamed for sloppy reporting, for sensationalistic reporting, for fake news. And so that created a lot of soul-searching among journalists. And here's the question for you uh, in the chat box. Normally, the governor of a state would be an excellent source for a big news story. But why was the governor not a good news source for this story? And who would have been better? Since the 1980s and the beginning of digital photography, it has become clear that reality can be manipulated much more easily than it could uh, when photojournalism was all on film. Now that said, photojournalistic images have always been altered a little bit. They're cropped, they're lightened, sometimes the background is blurred a little bit so that uh, the readers can see you know, the real newsworthy value. But with digital photo editing, it becomes very important to ask, you know, how much editing, photo editing, is too much? What's an acceptable level of photo manipulation and what's too much? Furthermore, if a photo is altered in some way, well, should the magazine or the newspaper or the television network, you know, should they be obligated to tell their readers, viewers, or listeners? Uh, exactly how it had been altered? Here's a question for the chat box. Should the same set of rules apply for editing photos for the front page of the Los Angeles Times as for the cover of Vogue? I mean, they are pretty different publications. I mean, should should the Times present literal truth in its photos? And if it does, if it's good for the Times, is it good for Vogue as well? Sometimes even reputable news organizations get caught up in embarrassing ethical lapses. Brian Walski was a veteran photographer for the Los Angeles Times. He was well thought of enough that uh, the Times sent him to be embedded uh, with troops in Iraq. In the photos that you see here, Brian Walski was shooting, um, th this happened to be a British soldier who was talking to some Iraqi villagers. And if you look at the upper two photos, you can see that Mr. Walski got two separate photos that were both half great. The photo at the upper left, well, look at the soldier. Look at how his body is, how he's got his weapon up and he's motioning with his free arm. That's dramatic. Now, look at the photo at the upper right. The soldier doesn't isn't in as dramatic a pose as in the first photo. But this second photo also has a dramatic element. Look, the man coming from the crowd with a little child in arms. Wouldn't it make a great photo if those two photos were photoshopped together? And without telling his editors, that's exactly what Mr. Walski did. And the result was the photograph below. The Times thought enough of the photo that they sent it out to other newspapers uh, that the Times had a photo-sharing arrangement with. 
it was an editor in Connecticut who looked at the villagers in the background and realized that some of the faces were duplicated and at that point realized that something strange was going on. Mr. Walski, despite his over 20 years of service with the Times, was summarily fired. Reports are he hasn't been able to get a job in journalism since. It was a fake. Even with the technology of 2004, you could take two photos at separate outdoor events, Photoshop them together, and have a realistic looking result. And if you could do it with the technology of 16 years ago, you can do it much more convincingly today. Well, I don't think you could get through a uh, chapter on media ethics without talking about advertising. How important is it for advertising claims to be true? And is it as important for every product that the ads be literally true? Well, in the U.S., ads that make claims about food and drugs are held to a higher standard than other ads. When it comes to food ads, even claiming to be the best needs to be documented, as the makers of Snapple found out some years ago. Snapple, for many years, had uh, the slogan, made from the best stuff on earth. Well, all right. Uh, apparently Snapple was called upon to define, well, what do they really think is the best stuff on earth? This bottle of Snapple iced tea is mostly water. All right. That's among the best stuff on earth. High fructose corn syrup? Hmm. Citric acid. I like the idea of natural flavors, but not in quote marks like that. That concerns me. And does Snapple iced tea actually have any tea in it? Well, yes. You can see that right up there at the tippy top of the bottle. So what do you think? 
Do you think that Snapple's claim about being made from the best stuff on earth is valid or, or not? Uh, tell me what you think in the chat box. Advertisers have control over the media that they place their ads in to a degree that I think the average person might not really realize. For example, with a lot of media outlets uh, in financial distress, an, advertising, an advertiser threatening to pull ads from a newspaper, a magazine, a, a TV station in response to a critical story, that can be a very intimidating threat. Furthermore, do you know how it is that of the many, many television shows that are proposed for the network's fall lineups, how are the decisions made and on what basis to put these shows instead of those shows onto the network? It isn't all about attracting the largest audience. It's about putting on the shows that advertisers would most like to advertise on. So when an advertiser expresses their, their power to pull ads from a magazine if there's a story about their company that they don't like, or they make it clear to the television network, hey, if you put this show on, you know, we'll think about advertising on it. Is that a form of freedom of speech? Or is that inhibiting freedom of speech? Tell me what you think in the chat box. The modern smartphone is to advertising in this era what television was in the Mad Men era. What I mean by that is it is a new, still growing, incredibly powerful advertising medium. With television, I think its power was to reach millions of people at once. The power of the smartphone, on the other hand, is how much it knows about you. The power of the smartphone is how messages can be targeted toward you to an eerie degree because of all the data that gets collected on your smartphone. I mean, think about it. Your phone knows where you are, where you like to stop, who your contacts are, what your hobbies are. Uh, your smartphone is just a treasure trove of information for advertisers. As for the ads that show up on smartphones, I'm not sure they're as developed yet as they will become. Of course, at the moment, when we think about smartphone advertising, we think about, we research a particular topic, we research, uh, you know, the Virgin Islands, or we, re or we research volleyball. And all of a sudden, we get an ad for volleyball, or we get an ad for a vacation to the Virgin Islands. Does that trouble you, uh, that ads show up on your browser after you've researched a particular topic? Let me know what you think. Hit the chat box with that. This will be the la uh, next to last slide uh, in this chapter. Last slide in the ethics chapter. Um, there are anecdotal reports of the internet being a much harsher place for women than for men. Anita Sarkeesian, for example, is a critic of the, uh, of the gamer culture. The gamer culture, uh, according to uh, Ms. Sarkeesian, uh, is not, does not just have a majority of male players, it has a sexist, oftentimes misogynistic uh, culture uh, in her estimation. 
Now, her critiques are sometimes harsh. However, the pushback that she has gotten has been more than harsh. It has been threatened violence to the degree where uh, uh, she was to speak at the University of Utah several years ago. And after credible threats, credible murder threats came into the university, she had to back out. So the question on the table for you in this last slide of the chapter is, do you feel that in general that women are treated more harshly than men on the internet? And if that is true, why do you feel that is the case? And that concludes chapter 14.